James Dotson, MD, is a psychiatrist with a fascination for the strange borderlands of fragrance. Uh, his interests include ethnobotany, alchemy, classical astrology, and archaic and traditional medicine. He has been a perfume blogger at Sniffapalooza magazine and is the first recipient of Now Smell This's Now Smell This Le Prix au Fou uh, Award in 2008. Uh, you can find out more about him at uncannysense.com, which will pop in the chat. And um, yeah, which one had already popped in the chat. And James, you are. You are up. So thank you. Um, I really want to thank Robin because she really set the stage for a lot of things I'm going to talk about. So she discussed this whole concept about higher and lower senses. So the higher senses of vision and hearing are thought to be the rational senses. And then um, smell and taste are irrational and primitive senses. However, in antiquity, as she discussed, perfume and incense were divine things. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about late 19th century um, Parisian decadence. And one of their focus was really going back to antiquity and kind of reclaiming a lot of antique things um, and really turning things upside down and reclaiming fragrance. So today, the main topic of my discussion is going to be late 19th century Paris and perfume experimentation. The person that I really want to draw your attention to is someone who's not well known by most people, but he was a symbolist poet and a perfume scholar. His name was Le Comte Robert de Montesquieu, and he is the star of this novel on the right. Um, and um, I'm going to give you a quote from Oscar Wilde, and his quote about the book is... It was a poisonous book. The heavy odor of incense seemed to cling about its pages and to trouble the brain. So he clearly identifies it both as heavily fragranced and as poisonous. So this was really a theme in um, late 19th century Parisian decadence. And this novel is considered like the hallmark of, of decadence. So Bear with me, I am now going to start my little timer. So I have a lot of material, I'm going to try to cram it in. So, um, advance. So the title of this book is A Rebord, and it translates literally as in reverse, but in most English translations, they will say against the grain. The whole idea is that it's really something that's anti-nature, it's extremely unnatural, um, and it's someone who's just going against the life current. Now, the working title of um, Huysmans was originally Seul, which means alone. And in fact, as I'll tell you in a sec, the whole focus of this novel is someone who's completely alone and isolated. So to give you sort of the basic idea, this is a novel that really has no plot. It is about a dissipated, extremely wealthy aristocrat whose name is Des Essentes, and he is really a mask for the uh, Robert de Montesquieu. So the Count has way too much money. His whole family is dead. He sells off his properties, and he has an architect design a house on the outskirts of Paris, where he decides he's going to go into complete seclusion all by himself, and he's going to spend every day doing aesthetic experiments, um, including perfume experiments. Um, I refer to his house as a monastery of the senses because when people go to a monastery, they take a vow to remove the exterior world and to spend all day in the contemplation and prayer and focus on divinity. In this case, the divinity is art or artifice. Um, and he goes to great lengths in creating what I call a pocket reality where he uses these very theatrical interiors and effects inside his house to explore senses um, and really shut out the world and just kind of go into the imaginal world. So on the right, this is a famous scene from the novel. Um, he is obsessed over color at one point and he loves his Persian carpets, but he wants to see light reflected on them. So he decides to purchase this tortoise and have it all gilt um, by a jeweler and watch the light sparkle off of it, but that's just not enough for him. So he sends it back and he has this, um, this shell completely inlaid with jewels so that he can see the light reflect off the jewels onto the carpet. And then of course, 
This results in the poor tortoise dropping dead because its shell is damaged, which is sort of a metaphor or warning about what happens when you just like dive into these experiments. They're very unnatural and the result in like illness and death. So um, on the left, the bottom is something that's part of a review of the novel. So when it appeared, it was extremely popular amongst the avant-garde um, you know, intellectual elite. But when the popular press reviewed it, they were like, we don't even know what this is. It has no plot, <laughs> which is true. And then it described it as a book with 30 pages of smells and 20 pages of flowers, which is in fact pretty much accurate. So um, we'll be focusing mostly on the smell stuff, of course. Um, and it is in the public domain and there's an adequate English translation, though you could purchase uh, one of the newer translations if you want it. It's chapter 10 that you wanna look at. So in chapter 10, he goes on to this binge of creating perfumes and he just sort of drops this sort of um, phrase like, oh, by the way, when I was in Paris, I was completely trained in the arts of perfumery and I brought all my materials with me. So then he walks into this room that has a perfume organ that is, of course, made entirely of ivory, where he has all these different essences. Some of them, a lot of them are raw materials. Some of them are like bouquets of flowers and also notably synthetic materials, which he talks about. And he talks about perfumery as an art. He literally describes it as an art. In one part, he compares it to composing poetry, to literature, and another, he compares it to music, the art of music. And the quote that I have here is when he compares it to jewelry, which is, um, you know, more of a decorative art. But he says, in perfumery, the artist completes the aroma initially furnished by nature shaping and setting the scent in the way a jeweler brings out the water of a precious stone and thereby gives it value. So it's, he has a very sophisticated understanding of perfume and I will, you know, you could read it, but he actually mentions a lot of materials and really appears to, um, to, to have a lot of technical information as well. So to set the context for this, we are talking about 1884. This is when the novel came out. Um, this is the Belle Epoque. So in general, the Belle Epoque is described as like 1870s, probably till about 1914, the beginning of World War I. When we go to school and learn about the Belle Epoque, it's all about this golden age of beautiful music and art and literature. Of course, we are taught the history of the dominant culture. We're never taught the history of the non-dominant culture but beneath the beauty of the Belle Epoque is always a shadow culture. So not only is this the demi monde, but there was this huge occult supernatural influence in late 19th century Paris, which uh, is called the occult revival in literature, where a lot of intellectuals and artists became obsessed with things like the Kabbalah and astrology and alchemy. And some of them started secret societies and Bookstores and salons were meeting places for people, including this writer Heismans, who, who did attend these salons. Um, at the same time, um, as you see on the right, there's a seance. So uh, uh, there was this huge focus on spiritualism and contacting the dead. And I'll be bringing this up because really perfume is something about resurrecting things things from the past. It's literally like putting a ghost in a bottle and this does come up. Also artists would bo um, borrow things from spiritualism. In particularly writers borrow this technique of automatic writing, which is like when people have a Ouija board and their hand moves automatically, they would use this um, with a pencil and they would automatically write like poetry and so on, which I will talk a little bit about. So this other thing I wanna mention is that this writer Hoismans Though he based this entirely on Montesquieu and he himself was not wealthy, he was a civil servant, he seemed to be really knowledgeable about fragrances. And before this came out, he wrote a sketch or essay called Le Gousset, which means the armpit. So this, interestingly enough, was like a travelogue of the odor of women's armpits, which is super fetishistic and seems kind of advanced for 1880. And again, this is available online if you want to read it. But for our purposes, what's interesting is that he has this incredible vocabulary for fragrance. Like he describes this peasant woman's armpit as smelling like duck and um, olives and um, shallots. And then a wealthy woman at a ball smells like overripe peaches and um, 
you know, bitter almonds, stuff like that. So he clearly knows how to describe things. Um, and I mentioned here the title La Ba. So after he wrote this book, he perhaps his more famous book was a book called La Ba, where he spent so much time with all these occult people, he wrote a book on the Black Mass in Paris, which includes some real people. And this was like some giant blockbuster for him. And there are some, some definitely diabolic elements in this book too. So what kind of weird stuff did this Des Essons do in the house? Well, he did a lot of really weird stuff, which I don't have time to discuss, but he did create an, an olfactory environment, um, which I think is fascinating. So he hired an architect to create an entire ship's cabin within his mansion using all the same materials he would use in a ship. Um, and then he had like seaweed and all these other things. He had these elaborate um, portholes and he had a system of light that came through colored water and he had mechanical fish that swam past. But what's important to us is that he had the scent of tar in this um, ship's cabin. Not, it's not quite clear whether he atomized it himself or he had some sort of system for doing it, but he actually created an environmental odor. It really reads like a weird environmental installation, but it was entirely for him for his own spiritual uh, uh, esoteric contemplation. He also did a lot of stuff with flavors. Um, he had an organ that you could play music, but when you hit the notes, these rare liqueurs would pop out of a little spigot. And when he finished, he would have this crazy mixology cocktail that was based on what he had played. This is obviously kind of obscure. He also decided once to have a black feast where all the food and beverages were the color black, you know, because he was celebrating the loss of his virility and his life in Paris. Um, he, he did a lot of other things that I would describe as mystical, which I'm gonna talk about. He would sit in front of this huge portrait of Salome by Moreau, and um, he said that he could, it was like he was sitting in front of the Virgin Mary, and he would describe Salome having a perverse odor of perfumes. Um, and he used this phrase, stranger flowers I seek. So he did not just want off the shelf perfumes, he was into experimenting with them. He specifically mentioned a lot of synthetics, and again, this is uh, 84. So, he mentions new mown hay as being something he experiments with. So that's Font Coupe, which is mostly Coumarin. And just, it's kind of interesting factoid that um, Coumarin is a synthetic that had been started to use in perfumes in the 1880s. Um, and, and, and so he apparently was really aware of this. Fougère Royale was one of the first famous um, perfumes using Coumarin. So um, he clearly knew a lot about perfume. So, Des Essent was a poster boy for melancholia, and it is kind of cogent to just like what his process was. So we use the word melancholy to refer to someone who's just kind of sad. Um, but uh, Des Essent had something that is, is much more intense than that. And there was a concept in the past um, in which people were born with a disposition called melancholia, where it felt like astrologically they were under the influence of Saturn. If you look to the right, this is from the Warburg Institute. It's this massive study that they just re-released that is about visual motifs and artistic theories surrounding this, this idea of melancholia, which was developed quite a bit in the um, Renaissance Florence by Marsilio Ficino. But basically the idea is if you were born with this curse, you were extremely isolated, you were depressed, but you had this heightened access to visionary states and self-absorption, which allowed you to do high philosophical thinking and, and, and to really pursue um, also um, any kind of artistic pursuit. It also meant that you were in danger of being possessed by demons because this whole thing was really kind of demonic. And there was this whole focus on um, Saturn and melancholy stuff referred to things from the past or things that were dead or ancestral knowledge. Um, so here we have a block print of an alchemist. Um, it's a little fuzzy, sorry. So here we see an alchemist to the left who is praying and up above it, I have the word lab and oratory. So an oratory is a private place of prayer and contemplation. Um, and a laboratory, obviously, is someplace similar to that. It's a place for work, but the whole idea is that everything is sealed off 
the conditions are confined because you really want the outside world to be gone because you're focusing on something. This alchemist, as you can see, has both an oratory and a laboratory all in one. In the upper right, you can see some of the alchemical vessels and so on. Um, and I refer to this as a containment field, which is honestly kind of a sci-fi term, but in physics, when they're doing like fusion reactions, they have magnetic fields that hold things in. And if you look on the sides of this, the edges are curved. This actually looks like a giant alchemical vessel, um, which reflects itself in perfume bottles, which also are used to contain something that um, is, is sort of this uh, mysterious spiritual thing. Okay, so distillation. So um, when you're doing perfume, um, Everything you do, all the perfume arts, um, are due to things that were developed uh, thousands of years in the past. So I write here that the roots are in Alexandria. So this is again a link to Egypt, but this is Greco-Roman Egypt, which is the very tail end of the, uh, uh, you know, Egy Egy Egyptian, mostly it's Greek. Um, and the, the roots were in archaic technologies like metallurgy, but there's a lot of document, uh, doc documentation from like about the second century AD about early kinds of experiments that are sort of in proto distillation. And then during the Islamic golden age, which was in the medieval era in Babylon, all these great scientists like Jabir um, and uh, a couple other famous physicians and um, uh, kind of polymaths, I would call them, developed the arts of distillation, which brought us rose water, and eventually, of course, distilled alcohol, which is the solvent that we use. What's important here is these mythic origins. So there are various sources, such as the Book of Jubilees and um, the, uh, uh, Enoch and others kind of sources, which give these myths that distillation was taught by fallen angels. Also, um, the arts involving plants, um, uh, cosmetics were considered being taught by fallen angels and also perfumes or, or fragrances are mentioned, but all these were considered angel tech, um, fallen angel tech. And so there is this whole route that like perfumery is essentially demonic. So next I have a picture of a, a dandy devil, as you can see on the right. So um, in the 19th century, the devil was often portrayed as this fabulous gentleman. You can see he has a well-cut suit and he has a cocktail. Um, and dandyism was really like at its pinnacle in the 19th century. Nowadays, when we say dandy, we generally refer to a person who's really obsessed with their personal appearance and wants to look fabulous. But we're talking more about a metaphysical dandyism. It's a person whose entire life focus 24 seven, obviously you can't really have a job, you have to be rich, <laughs> mostly, is to focus on art and, and artifice, like the dandy just lives for art. Um, so the devilish thing here that I think is important is that the devil mimics the creator, and we talked about this angel tech with perfumery. So the devil actually creates things in, in mimicry of, of God. Um, and so this essentially makes perfume unnatural. Um, as I said here, I write unnatural bouquets of flowers. So when you create perfumes, the various components are flowers and plants from different continents that bloom at different times. You would never find those together. Um, a chimera is like an, an animal like a sphinx that has different parts put together. So you're basically stitching together things from different places and times. And then when you throw in synthetics, it is like a mad scientist uh, Frankenstein monster thing where you're bringing these together and this could be considered very unnatural. So um, I've written here, it, it, it is like doing seances or necromancy where you reanimate the parts of dead plants and put them back together to make perfume. Now, if this isn't obvious, like necromancy is totally my jam. So for me, this is incredible, but it does create this negative spin where perfume is seen uh, as poisonous or evil. Okay, why is this not going? There we go. Okay, yay. Okay, now we have our hero or anti hero. So, Le Comte Robert de Montesquieu um, was the character behind Des Essentes. He also was Proust's, one of Proust's most famous characters, Charlus or the Baron de Charlus, and he was in fact Proust's professor of beauty. Like, Proust was, uh, I mean, Proust was like his acolyte or student, and he would hang around with him and, um, Montesquieu taught him immense 
uh, amounts of stuff about artists, about music, and about perfume, as we'll find out. So Lecon was, uh, Robert de Montesquieu was really well known as a super esthete. I mean, obviously from looking at him um, in his portrait by Boldini, he was this incredible dandy. In fact, he was referred to sometimes as dandy, le plus dandy, like the most dandy of all dandies. Um, I use the quote extra human, extra human because I think um, it was John Singer Sargent, the artist referred to him that way because he just felt like he was like not like anyone he had ever met before. This was a frequent comment. He came from this ancient dynasty and Proust is really into this. The oldest dynasty of aristocracy that pretty much had died out except for him were the Merovingian. And they had this incredible like supernatural lore because his ancestor uh, uh, back, you know, zillions of years ago was a queen who took a bath in the ocean one day and this thing called a quinitar, which is like a dark fairy came out and had sex with her. So the whole family is supposed to be descended from like some supernatural thing and they were like these sorcerer kings. So he had this whole, you know, thing already of being like not exactly human. He wrote this book of poetry, um, which is almost 400 pages called Le Chef des Odeurs Suaves. So Le Chef could be translated as master of odors, and he was considered by, by his um, various people in the community as like an absolute master of fragrances. And this whole thing was like 400 pages of poems about flowers and about fragrances. He had a presentation copy that he gave to Proust, and Proust said that, you know, this is like one of his favorite books, and it, it was probably fairly um, influential. So Le Conte, um, I'm referring him in two terms, and I refer you to reading Catherine Maxwell's Sense and Sensibility, which is this amazing book. He is what is called an olfactif, meaning he has an extraordinary sense of smell. He's also a fleureur. Fleureur means sniffer, literally. But what it means is someone whose entire life is focused on fragrance, no matter what they do, where they travel, what they see, all they are doing is focusing entirely on smell. Um, and he definitely embodies this. But at the same time, as I'd mentioned, smell had fallen. It was considered um, atavistic, meaning it brought you back to these ancient forms, ancient cultures, things from long ago, which was considered undesirable. And it was a sign of degeneracy. So. In the late 19th century, degenerate had more of a medical term. It, it oh, I'm gonna have to hurry. So it was more of a medical term and meant uh, often referred to people from like sexual minorities and uh, you know gender minorities and things like that. So what did he do to create perfumes? So he um, was described, this is described in various accounts that he was the first person to use perfume as decor, which is kind of a burn, not really an art, it was like a decoration. But he actually had separate rooms in his home that had different themes. He had a sun room that was gold and crimson that had one fragrance. He had a moon room that was silver and azure. And people were like, we don't really know how he's doing it, but he has these perfume diffusers or brut de parfum that appear to give different perfumes to different environments. And he has this whole symbolic thing going on. So he had these immersive environments. He rarely invited people in. It was mostly poets and a few people. So there aren't a lot of accounts to give me exact details, but he was obsessed by creating all these different spaces that he would inhabit. And he would, you know, do poetry. He was a spiritualist, as I may have, um, didn't really mention overtly. So like the spirits would like dictate things to him. So we're now up to 1900. So this is the World's Fair of 1900, which is a huge thing. There were um, almost, there's something like 48 million people attended it. And the perfume industry had this thing called the Perfume Pavilion. And they ask um, Montesquieu to write the guide to their exhibit because he was considered to be the authority on perfume for all of Paris. So this is fascinating because it was probably one of the first attempts to publicly educate the public about perfume. I have no idea how many people attended, but if there were 48 million in the whole fair, it was a lot. So he wrote this guide called um, Retrospective Museum of class 90 perfumeries where they had raw materials, equipment, processes, and products. So, you know, he this was a guide to all aspects of perfumery. Later, he turned this into this fancy volume called Pays des Aromates. And at the bottom, I have a little Proust quote from 1901 because he loved it so much, he sent him this letter and it basically says, you know, from these scented boxes whose odors have long since departed to become reunited with the roses, 
perfumed by them from faces long covered with dust, from these perfume sprays that have not retained the odor of memory, but above all, from these pages with infinite profound grace, it seems that something both disturbing and delightful is being given off, yet more immaterial, the imperishable perfume of the past. So this is long before he wrote A La Recherche de Tom Perdu. So he was like very into perfume. This seems to be like an early indication of his whole thing about perfumes being uh, something from the past. Okay. Oop, I'm going to finish up now quickly. So this book is like constantly gets rediscovered by artists. So it became a cult text of, of decadence. So the surrealists were very into it. I've read a lot of stuff about Andre Breton, who was obsessed with it. Dali, of course, he was a dandy. He writes a lot about it in his Diary of a Genius. Um, and it was anthologized again and again so people would see it. So in the 60s, it was definitely rediscovered. And it was really like a big deal around the time of like uh, this special time in the 60s when the Rolling Stones were really into like decadence and Satan and, and everyone who was anyone would read this. Um, so they had this interaction. The Rolling Stones had this interaction with Kenneth Anger. At the right, you can see film stills from Anger um, where they did several films. One of them was Lucifer Rising and um, uh, the other one is Invocation of My Demon Brother. Um, and so to speed ahead, the reason why this is important is because all these things got reimagined during the hippie 60s kind of obsession with occult things. And Anton LaVey, um, and this is a still from Invocation of My Demon Brother by Kenneth Anger. Anton LaVey was this kind of huckster guy who had this salon in San Francisco and was friends with Kenneth Anger. And he decided to found the Church of Satan which seemed like was a joke, but he was actually really well read. And he had this essay on something called Total Environments, which very much reflect the theatrical um, environments of Kenneth Anger and of Hoisman's. And he does mention Hoisman's because of course of the Black Mass, but he said that it was very important for people to create this ritual milieu where they had a, a personal ritual space and they could immerse themselves in all these sensory clues um, and escape from the herd and distill this nostalgia from the past. And if you were able to do this, you would be able to actually um, perform acts of magic because it would give you this connection with the imaginal world and let you actually create changes through the power of imagination that would be reflected in reality. So, well, let's go to questions. I have, of course, like a million more things, but I sped through this, okay. Yeah, I wish we had more time as well because this is a topic that, that could really go deep. James, do you want to sort of, I mean, is there anything you sort of, uh, is there a last slide that we pushed you through? Because I don't want to. No, no, I just, I, not really. I mean, I would have developed this a little bit more, um, but because it's like a, you know, hour and a half talk that I boiled down. But mostly it's just, you know, Montesquieu was very interesting. He was an expert on perfume. He's kind of forgotten. Um, and the fact that Hoisman mentions like synthetics and perfume as art and like, you know, olfactory um, environments. And there's a little bit described about Montesquieu creating these weird olfactory environments that were very experimental, mostly for himself. They weren't necessarily for the public and they were meant to propel his ability to write poetry and so on. So there's something about an obsessive environment that gives you access to like the dream, dream world, the world of imagination, which allows you to cast spells or do magical things literally according to Kenneth Anger. Oh, Dorothy wants to read more and wants to know if you're going to publish this work in any way, fascinating stuff. So Dorothy, um, luckily for public domain, if you speak French, it's available. There's an adequate English translation that is in the public domain, and there's a newer English translation you could easily get through any of your bookstores or libraries. There's very little um, about Montesquieu. Most of it is out of print that I had to like hunt down. Um, there, there's some histories of perfume that do mention him because he's obviously very important, but a lot of those are out of print too, which is sad. A lot of historical perfume stuff is hard to get. Um, will I publish it? Like, yes, theoretically, I am have like these giant stacks of notes all around me like Proust and eventually I'll sit in bed and finish them, I guess, yeah. <laughs> Don't so forget the Madelines. Uh, Jackie is making the point that the immersive environments predated VR, but I, I definitely see the relationship, um, which is kind of interesting. Jackie's speaking uh, next week about uh, her pioneering work in virtual reality. Right, I mean, I think of like Disneyland as an immersive environment, but this totally. is like the 1800s. It was very bizarre, so yeah. Fantastic. All right, guys. Um, Thanks. 
Uh, yeah, so Anna, uh, James mentioned at the beginning of the talk that uncannysense.com is a work in progress, so I imagine. The it's question ugly. is, oh, it's ugly. <laughs> wonderful <laughs> things are ugly, man. Uh, the question was, uh, do you talk more about this on your website? And the answer is, you will soon. Um, I have a whole thing on ghosts and what they smell like, if you want to read that. Yes, yes. <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, well, James, thank you so much um, for thank your you. time. It's always a pleasure to hear your thoughts.